Well, oh, by the way, thank you to my friend in uh, up near Niagara, Niagara Falls up that way. I know almost exactly where he lives and, and this is the kind of small world we live in. The town he actually does live in for quite a while, they used to pick up auto parts in his town and uh, just, and all the time I was that close to Niagara Falls, I never could take the time to go up to Niagara Falls that close. I'm talking probably 15 or 20 miles from maybe 20. Anyway, uh, where I used to pick up was about 20 miles from Niagara Falls, but I just did not have time. If anybody's ever hauled auto parts, uh, by the time you pick your load up, you're already late for your delivery. It's just, that's the way it works in the auto parts business. So uh, there was never a spare minute when I hauled auto parts, which is why I only hauled auto parts for a couple years. Good money, uh, nice straight out and back runs, but pressure, pressure, pressure. Some of the fastest speeds I ever did in an 18-wheeler were when I was hauling auto parts. And I think I told you the story about I was doing 105 one time, coming across 30 in Arkansas. And they had just put these barriers up. Uh, what do they call them? Cables. The Oh, they put these cables in the center of the highway where people, if they have a wreck, they won't go on to the oncoming side of the interstate. So... <laughs> Uh, it was about three, and I, believe me, I didn't typically speed, but like I said, uh, when they're on the phone constantly telling you, they're going to shut the plant down if you don't get it there. And what they mean is put it to the floor. And I was an owner operator, so uh, the only limit to my speed was how hard I was willing to press the pedal. So I'm uh, doing 105. My wife is in the bunk, sound asleep. Uh, it was about 3 in the morning, and sure enough, state cop going the other way, puts his blue lights on, and I know he's fixing to turn around, and I, I happen to know just how far back the turnaround is, so I come up with a plan. I jumped off the interstate at the very next exit. I pulled into the uh, truck stop. I parked my truck in the fuel island, and I went inside. I grabbed me a newspaper and went into the bathroom, and uh I'm kind of leaning. I knew he was going to be looking around for the driver of that yellow freight liner, Canary Yellow. Actually, he didn't know what, because at night, yellow looks white or light blue or beige or cream or vanilla. Uh, so he's walking around the truck stop, and then eventually he makes it into the bathroom. And I'm looking, I'm peeking down underneath the stalls, and I see cop shoes. They're not trucker shoes. They're not boots, and they're not sneakers. And uh, he comes in there and he looks around. And when he, I get up, I flush the toilet. And uh, I put my newspaper underneath my arm. And I go over and wash my hands. And I look at him and said, hey, how are you? He goes, how long have you been here? I said, oh, probably 15 or 20 minutes. Long enough to get a cup of coffee and use the bathroom. He said, are you in that Tango truck? Which didn't mean anything because there's like 30 Tango. It was a Tango truck stop. Tango was the company I was leasing my truck to. And... Uh, I said, yes, sir, I am. And uh, he looks at me real suspicious, and I walk past him, and uh, I walk out <laughs> to my truck, and I get in and leave, and he didn't follow me. So that would have been a going-to-jail ticket right there. And uh, my wife would not have been happy. So anyway, that's a story that I didn't intend to tell you. But that's the kind of rush we had to be in, and, and I couldn't do it for long. It, it, just the stress was unbearable and every load like i say the second you got the load on your trailer you were already late getting it there and they didn't waste any time telling you and here's the other thing that i realized after two years of this nonsense not once did they ever shut the plant down because my parts didn't get there on time not once so it was all bs uh to get you there fast to get you another load and tango they had really developed a reputation as you know one of them companies that were speed demons and you know the cops would pull you over just because they were assumed just just because you looked fast if you had chrome on your truck so uh that's when i moved on and then we found the best job i ever had in my life and that was forward air no speeding as a matter of fact my wife and i we had a, a an agreement between us uh we didn't go six over 65 maybe 67 if you caught up to like a 65 mile an hour truck 
you know, you speed up and get around it, and then you set your cruise at 67, and then as you got further away, you'd bump your cruise down a couple miles an hour. So much more easier to drive at a reasonable, calm, peaceful speed, and we could both sleep. So for 12 years, that's how we drove, slow, calm, and I'll tell you, we would get from Dallas to L.A. in 22 hours at 65 miles an hour. That's, you know, switching seats when we're going down the road. So maybe some people who've never drove teams don't know how that works. Uh, here I am behind the wheel, right? I get up, I slide my seat all the way back, and I air it to the floor. And I stand up, and I move over like this, and I hold on to the side of the wheel. She comes in beside me, sits down, grabs the wheel, and I'm, I'm out of it. We did that not hundreds, but thousands of times, probably several times a day if you had to pee. Okay, here's what I was going to tell you. And just as I was turning the camera on to tell you, this happened. This thing is amazing. Now, it is the big buddy. And I'm telling you, I could have got away with the single, the, the little buddy, I think they call it. It's just a, like a single burner. It's half of that, right? And I've used this thing, God, five, six times. I used it in the house. I used it here. Uh... And it, it, it warms in the length of time it took me to go get a cup of hot chocolate and come back. That thing had warmed this up significantly, comfortable where I could have taken off my jacket. And uh, just as I was about ready to brag about it, it ran out of gas. But I only had one bottle in it, and that one bottle has lasted forever. Not forever, but hours and hours and hours. I don't know, I don't know how long. When it warms up in here, I just shut it off. And that fan, had the fan in here, and it blows all that hot air across and warms it up real quick. So that is a really good purchase. And another really interesting thing happened. For the first time ever, I touched the cat's face this morning. Uh, I, in the morning, I have, like, uh, treats that I give her, and I get to dig a few treats out of this bag, just a little handful, right? And I was reaching, and she, she I always brush her whiskers when I go put her treats down for her. And this time... I took my finger and I stroked the side of her face and she didn't freak out. So I'm gonna try it again tomorrow. And who knows, I may be scratching underneath that chin before you know it. Okay, I'm going to uh, sharpen these two knives. And uh, the fellow who bought this, I understand is hunting somewhere. He's taken a week off and gone hunting. I was hoping I could get this to him. So if he uh, killed a deer, he could use this to skin it. But I didn't get it done quick enough. And uh, boy, I'm really happy with how my edges are coming out. This is the best that I've ever done on these edges. And um, finally, I have the nat, the trick, the little, the sequence, basically. It's the steps and the chemicals that you use. And uh, one of these days, if anybody's interested, I'll show you my process. Because there's a lot of people that, and I'm one of them, that I couldn't do edges like this for the longest and, you know, you get a little info here and a little info there, and you try a different product, and uh, you try different techniques. And I realized that one of the things I was doing was I was trying to... I wasn't letting these dry 100% completely dry before I sanded them. Here, what I do is when I make the sheath, mostly they're wet still, right? Because I soak them down so you can fold them over and they'll take a stamp and stuff like that. So they're wet, not soaking wet, but damp. And uh, I was doing the whole thing on the same day, but these two, I let them dry overnight. And then I came back and I did the edges. And that is the, the thing that made it 100% better was making sure they were 100% dry. And I come out here and I put it on this belt sander here, right on the round, on the end. And I sand the edges smooth, and then I take my beveler and I bevel the edges. Uh, and then I take something called gum tragacanth. And you rub it down, you rub it in here with your finger, you rub it in real hard, and you let it dry. And then you take fine sandpaper, and you sand this down really fine. And then I've got this wax that comes from Germany. It's a shoe polish wax, and the person I heard this from is Kyle Royer. And uh, 
I left a comment asking him how he made his edges on his sheath so shiny and perfect. And he told me what they used. And I Googled it and I found it and it comes from Germany. And I could only, I put two in my cart, but they only had one. So I bought the one they had, which happened to be brown. They had two colors, basically brown and black. And uh, brown is the only one I was able to get, but I keep looking and as soon as it's back in stock, I'm gonna get the black. So what you do is you just rub this uh, shoe polish on the edge after you get the, the edge nice and smooth. And then I take a burnisher in a Dremel and I just go back and forth. I start, I start on the corners, the edges that I beveled, even up here, up here, that's done. So uh, I just have finally got my technique perfected and I think it's probably what most of the other people that get their edges to look like that do. So anyway, that's uh, the cat, yeah. And uh, I was just, uh, you know, having a good morning. I was able to basically touch the cat without her attacking me or threatening to. She didn't hiss. She didn't claw at me. She has clawed me. Once she clawed me and didn't connect, and once she clawed me and drew blood, I keep in mind, this nobody's touched this cat for, I, this is the 11th year that cat has lived under this trailer right up on that end. And uh, I've been feeding her for four years now, every morning uh, up here. And I've gone through this, I've showed you, just outside the back door and above, she stays on the roof right on that corner and I feed her. And uh, anyway, just uh, getting to rub her face today and not, not have her freak out was kind of a, a big step. So here I am, I'm going to uh, sharpen these and uh, they're ready to go. And then I'm gonna start, first I'm gonna drink my hot chocolate. And uh, then I'm going to, I haven't decided what, I'm gonna work on these two. I'm gonna try to get the bevels ground today. And I have not decided what I wanna use, if I wanna use these uh, presentation grade desert iron wood or not. You wanna see what that's gonna look like? Let me get my sprayer. Here's the other one. The water just makes you see the grain a little better, the character. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna use them on these two. These are matching and uh, they're uh, Chechen. These are Chechen Burl, dyed brown, and they're matching scales. And these are from my friend in Russia, Oleg Bashkevich. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and stick with my original plan, and uh, that's to use these. If I make a one-off knife or something, I'll, I'll hang on to them for it. All right, I'm gonna sneeze. <clears throat> Good Lord. Now I gotta blow my nose. <clears throat> it's that time of, time of year when uh, leaves and everything start decaying. I start getting uh, allergies. Start uh, spring and fall. Okay, let me get to work. Drink my hot chocolate and oh, one more thing. That was the last thing I wanted to tell you. This this come out. This has some beautiful wood there. Beautiful. And I ended up the piece was so thick. I ended up with one <clears throat> piece left over and it's enough to make two three finger knives I can get two what cut it in half this way and cut it in half this way and that will give me scales for two three finger knives so that's pretty good news there so I got one with the bevels ground and now I've got the uh, initial 
grind lines sanded out. And let me tell you something I'm trying. I've tried this a while ago, but I didn't have enough muscle memory and the knowledge that I have now to make this work. And when you take this off the belt, the hardest grit of all the grits I do are the first grit from the belt to the sandpaper and uh, sanding the grind lines out of it. That is the hardest grit to do. So a long time ago, I bought these, they're called finishing stones. And uh, they are 120 grit. And right up here in the plunge line, right up here, is the hardest part to get the grind lines out. And sometimes, you know, even though there may be a, a grind line still left in the plunge line, and I've been working and working and working on it, sometimes I let it go. And I think about it the whole process, the whole way. I'm, I mean, nobody else would probably ever see it, but I see it. And it's something that I know that I'm going to have to address. Well, guess what? I put this on my belt grinder, my big belt grinder, my 6x48. And I ground a little wedge on it. Here. And that allows me to get right up in here and get them really hard to get to grind lines out and while I'm at it I just go ahead and knock the tops off the grind line so I don't have to use so much sandpaper and this is what they are they're called finishing sticks and uh, that's the company that makes them they're made in USA and you can get them in different grits I, I chose 120 because typically these come off my belt grinder anywhere from 60, 80, 100 to 120. What it, you know, sometimes I'll, it depends what, if it's a brand new belt, I use 120 because I can make it a nice bevel with a new belt, 120 belt. Uh, I use 80 grit to the initial shape of my handles, and if it gets wore out, then I use them on the metal. So it really de depends what grid I use, depends on what belts I have and what I use them for previously. I hope that's not too screwed up a, of an explanation. But anyway, uh, going from the grinder to sanding off the grind lines is the hardest part of this. And, you know, sometimes it takes a day or more, but it is about two hours since I ground these bevels here. And now I'm moving up to 220. This is 220, I'm fixing to start 220 on this. So that's uh, really a time saver. And I finally figured out how to use them because they do, if you don't use them right, you can leave some real deep gouges and it takes a lot more sanding to get the gouges out. So you gotta be careful. And that's initially why I stopped using them because basically I didn't have the finger memory, the muscle memory and uh, I do now, so, okay. That probably wasn't as interesting for you as it is for me. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna get uh, sand, and I'm probably gonna sand up to 220, and then uh, put that other knife on the bevel grinding machine, my jig up there, and uh, get that one started too. I kinda wanna do both of these at the same time. Uh, neither one is spoken for, but since they are a pair and they're going to look pretty much identical. One of them, I already have the sheath made. That's this. And uh, I don't know if I can duplicate that. I really don't because I have found that even though you're cutting from the same piece of leather, if you cut a piece of leather from this side of the shoulder and then you cut a piece of leather from the other side of the shoulder... They're going to die differently. And uh, that's really hard to, hard to duplicate. And I do have a piece of that leather left. So who knows? Maybe I can duplicate it. But in case anybody wanted to buy both a matched set, they would be available. And they'll be mirror polished too. So that's what I'm working on now. I have no orders. And uh, tomorrow I will mail this along with the Kydex sheath. And... Uh, 
whenever the guy back gets back from vacation, this will go to him. And this is my uh, friend David that lives sort of behind me over here. He works at a place I, uh, where I showed you the video of the machine he worked on. Well, uh, somebody he works with is getting that, so. Okay, let me get back to sanding. All right, there's one sanded up to 800. Now, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm gonna get the other one, the bevels ground, and maybe the uh, grind lines sanded off. I may get that far. I'll see after I get the bevels ground. Okay, there's number two. And uh, somebody mentioned in another video that I'd got a little hot on a blade. I grind my bevels before I heat treat, so uh, this sands off, it's superficial. <clears throat> and uh, I'll show you just a second. Comes right up. See what I'm saying? So uh, it doesn't affect the steel. When you heat treat it, it all is exactly, you know, hard steel. So uh, I think I'm gonna go ahead and, it's three o'clock now. I'm gonna go ahead and try to sand these grind lines out and have that done because that is the hardest part of this whole thing, is sanding the grind lines. And I'm gonna use my little, what do they call them? What did I just call them? <laughs> Good Lord. Finishing stones. Okay. All right, see you in a bit. All right, it is four in the afternoon. Still got plenty of rain. And uh, this is number two. I've got this sanded up to 220. That is 320. So uh, looking good. Got a real good start on having two knives. I'm not going to be here tomorrow, Tuesday. So Wednesday, I'll be back out here and I'll finish sanding this one up to 800. Uh, buff them both out. Get them both heat treated and both in the tempering oven. We'll make some quick work of that. I'm not even a, you know, a quarter of the way through because I got to go through the cleanup process after I heat treat them and temper them. I got to go back to about 400, clean them all up, and then 600, then 800, then rebuff them. Then I can put the handles on. So, uh, and then, you know, I got to shape the handles and rebuff them all again, make the sheaths, put the edge on. So I'm about a quarter of the way at this point. Alrighty, have a good Tuesday, y'all. And Tuesday, today, is my wife's birthday. Uh, we celebrated a little early the other day because we were already out. And uh, there was a Chinese restaurant near Sam's that we both like. So, And Bev was with us, so we all ate. But tomorrow we're going to eat at our little Mexican restaurant here in, in our town. We got one Mexican restaurant, and it's pretty good for a little town of 2,100 people. So uh, tomorrow's her birthday, which Tuesday, you'll see this Tuesday, it's today, Tuesday. I'm in Monday, you're in Tuesday. <laughs> you ready to go home? Let's do it. Have a good Tuesday.